by the early 1980s, Brezhnev and his minions and the regime were weak, tired, and aging. The end of the taunt occurred, of course, as I described it in the previous lecture, with the Russian deployment in Afghanistan. But on top of that, there is new pressure coming from a newly elected president, Ronald Reagan, who has the kind of vigor and, and youth, despite his chronological age, um, that certainly Brezhnev no longer has. The policy of containment that began with Truman and was carried on by Eisenhower and Kennedy, and the policy of detente under Nixon, Ford, and Carter, Carter is utterly rejected by Reagan, who now vigorously promises to forget containment and to roll back communism in the way Woodrow Wilson attempted at the birth of the Soviet Union in the wake of the 1917 Bolshevik seizure of uh, power. Reagan essentially dismisses all American foreign policies toward the Soviet Union that began under Truman's administration after the death of um, uh, Roosevelt. Reagan sees himself as a Western warrior fighting a war against what he describes as an empire of um, evil, an evil regime. Reagan will actively exasperate Soviet problems inside of Afghanistan by heavily supporting the Afghani rebels. Again, something that I have already covered in the previous uh, lecture. It's um, on Reagan's watch that we get the formation of the Taliban that is sponsored by Pakistani intelligence with U.S. money. Reagan essentially meets with the ta uh, Taliban, telling them in 1985 that um, they are warriors for peace and democracy against a kind of atheistic communism and tells the press, quote, these gentlemen are the moral equivalents of America's founding fathers, end of quote. Reagan as well, in his promise to roll back communism, begins a new arms race, what um, will become known as Star Wars for uh, this kind of futuristic implementation of technology in which the United States is well in advance of the Soviet Union now burdened by the previous arms race, which had nearly bankrupted the Soviet Union and only detente essentially, and the strategic arms limitation um, agreements signed in the 1970s saved the USSR from total economic collapse. They certainly would have been unable to keep up with um, the economy of the United States. And of course, now Reagan introducing this third generation of uh, weapons that um, would have used all these new advanced technological systems. And it's a question even whether Star Wars would have actually worked. However, it um, presents to the Soviet Union 
this necessity of now keeping up with whatever technological developments the United States had planned or at least discussed um, of implementing into the global security system that um, the United States operated. So he puts tremendous pressure now on the Soviet Union at, the, at its worst time possible as they're mired in Afghanistan very much in the same way that the United States was mired in Vietnam some um, you know, 15 years previously. The um, shooting down, the basically, uh, we still don't quite understand how that occurred, whether this was an error or whether this was um, a message from the Soviet Union as there was a possibility that the Korean airliner was being used as a kind of surveillance uh, platform as it drifted across into the Soviet airspace. Nonetheless, the shooting down of this Korean airliner in, um, I think it was 1983 that it occurred in, was very much reminiscent of the Cuban um, missile crisis and, and, and certainly brought tensions between countries um, at a height that we hadn't seen since the Cuban missile crisis. And again, once again, the, the, the prospect of thermal nuclear war became a, a realistic one once more after what we thought was the end of the Cold War, um, you know, that detente period of the 1970s. During this early 1980s period, um, a labor movement among uh, Polish dock workers, Solidarnosts, under the leadership of Lech Walesa becomes a powerful force inside of communist Poland. Um, attempts by Polish authorities to put down this popular labor movement are, are failing. The Soviet Union at this point in the early 1980s is rattling his sword about perhaps intervening under the Brezhnev doctrine as um, they did, of course, in Hungary in 1956, long before Brezhnev, but certainly as they did in Czechoslovakia in 1968. Um, but um, now, of course, the Soviet Union finds itself too weak and too hobbled to actually present a real threat of invasion to uh, Poland. Um, the Soviets will undertake typically a number of um, military exercises at, uh, on, you know, near the Polish border, but it comes clear to everybody that um, the Soviet Union is now militarily bankrupt. It's bogged down in Afghanistan and um, politically as well as um, the Moscow Olympics were now boycotted, um, as Reagan is um, ramping up the Star Wars platforms, the Brezhnev doctrine is indeed bankrupted. The Soviet Union is in no position to intervene in Poland the way it was able to intervene in Czechoslovakia in 1968, nor does it have the kind of um, political tolerance of the United States, which was pursuing at that moment when um, the Soviets entered into Czech Czechoslovakia, a policy of detente, um, that is no longer an advantage on which um, Brezhnev could count. In the meantime, those, what I described as a kind of um, that socialist affluence and availability of um, food and basic 
basics, um, you know, basic uh, needs like shelter, food, and and and, and clothing, and, and so far medical um, uh, medical services all begin to deteriorate in the Soviet Union as again the Afghani war, the failure of detente and all the potential trade that would have come with it um, is now beginning to bankrupt essentially the socialist economy that had been providing these basic necessities to the people of the Soviet Union. And we begin to see um, sporadic shortages in certain areas. Here you can see people are lined up for um, milk. Um, another day it could be bread. Another day it could be uh, meat. And, and so these shortages begin to characterize this late period of the Brezhnev regime. Unlike the kind of the hopeful um, period of the 1970s again. The Soviet leadership, the Politburo, the Central Committee, is aged. Um, it's kind of um, has this inability to um, act with vigor. It, it um, has lost its uh, vision. And um, essentially is, as I say, becoming decrepit, swollen, old, um, in particular Brezhnev himself, as he is rapidly declining in, in, in health. They're um, stumbling about now becoming themselves a victim of their own zastoy, their own stagnation. It's um, wonderfully captured by the British satirical puppet show, um, Spitting Image. Brezhnev himself um, is drinking himself to death. Um, it's, it's been essentially the policy of um, and the necessity of the Soviet propaganda machine to um, airbrush bottles of alcohol out of uh, pictures of uh, Brezhnev, as here you see in this case, Brezhnev meeting with um, the chancellor of West Germany, Willy Brandt, um, those bottles had to be airbrushed um, out of the picture. Brezhnev is in terrible health by 1982. And indeed, in 1982, Brezhnev will pass away. And that's the end of the ride his um, family had in the nomenclature of um, wealth and privilege in the Soviet Union. The Politburo now um, will choose Yuri and Dropov to replace Brezhnev. Certainly in um, his pictures and Dropov in his official portraits uh, looks far more younger and vigorous than Brezhnev, but in actuality, he won't be. And Dropov was the former head of the KGB under Brezhnev. Moreover, um, he, prior to becoming the head of the KGB, Andropov was also the ambassador to Hungary um, in 1956 when the Soviet Union executed that uh, bloody invasion of Hungary and, and suppressed the Hungarian uprising. And so Andropov certainly has a lot of blood on his hands, not only as the former ambassador, uh, but as well as the former head of the uh, KGB. He is um, more aged than portrayed in, as I say, official uh, portraits and much more fragile and within 
something like 18 months uh, his uh, appointment, Yuri Andropov will uh, die. Andropov, interestingly enough, during his sh short regime was almost paving the way for Gorbachev in, in the sense that almost like Beria, uh, he, he appeared to be a more um, liberal and progressive leader. And it's interesting how former KGB, uh, these two former KGB heads, once they come to power, uh, take on this kind of progressive identity and it may have something to do with having as intelligence chief um, absolute access to information about what was happening inside the country um, being perhaps part of the apparatus that was suppressing progressive movements inside the country i, I don't know how else to explain it nonetheless uh, before the Urian drop-off could really implement any kind of um, proposals for reform that he was entertaining, he does die. And, you know, one of the last old men left on the Politburo, Konstantin Chernyenko, uh, now becomes the next um, chairman of the Communist Party, the party secretary, who essentially since Brezhnev has been leading the country. Um, Konstantin Chernyenko, unfortunately, is, um, you know, he could be explained as already, you know, best described as being already dead. Um, you know, his even his portraits appear to be mummified. Uh, Chernyenko is in terrible um, health. He can barely move. Um, they occasionally manage to wheel him out onto the Kremlin, um, the mausoleum balcony where the leaders of the Soviet Union traditionally pose and um, he manages to raise one arm. But Chernyenko spends most of his period while um, appearing to run the Soviet Union in a hospital bed. Um, and, and so we have these very few uh, pictures of, of, of Chernyenko actually um, up on two feet and very quickly um, uh, Chernyenko will um, pass away as, as, as well without really having much impact on change in the Soviet Union. This death of Chernyenko now will bring Mikhail Gorbachev into power. Um, he's essentially the only guy left in the Central Committee or the Politburo um, who's not at death's door. Gorbachev comes from an entirely different generation. Um, he is younger by some, you know, um, 15 to 25 years than all his predecessors. Um, he is a child of the 1930s. Um, he's born in 1931. He is a mix of um, Russian-Ukrainian ethnicity. His background is, um, he comes from a peasant family. He, of course, is a child of the famine of 1931 and collectivization. On um, his birth, he's named Victor, but his mother insists on a more Christian name, Mikhail, and will secretly baptize him. His grandfather will actually perform the christenings. Um, many members of um, Gorbachev's peasant family are lost to the Stalin purges or arrested. Um, Gorbachev is raised in um, abject, barefoot poverty. Um, he'll be 10 in 1941, 
when the Nazis invade the Soviet Union and his village will come under a uh, German occupation for a period during the war. Um, his father will be severely wounded in the war. Um, typically during the Second World War, the Germans um, suspended all schools for Russian children and, and um, Gorbachev essentially from 1941 when he's 10 till 1944 when he's 14 um, does not go to school. Kind of similar to my father's experience. Um, he reluctantly will return to school in 1944. Once the war ends, um, Gorbachev will work with his demobilized father driving harvester combines on various collective farms. Um, and Gorbachev will be um, in the late 1940s for outstanding work as a um, harvest combine dr dr harvest combine driver he will be awarded the order of the red banner of labor which here you can see on an early portrait of gorbachev him wearing on his chest this is a um, very high award in um, civilian life in the soviet union he uh, joins, of course, the Komsomol, which is a communist Molodyov or the communist youth movement. Um, and he becomes a candidate for membership in the Communist Party. And indeed, in 1950, when he's 19 years old, he will be um, admitted into the Communist Party. And at the same time, with his... Um, award of the Red Banner of Labor and his peasant background, he is fast-tracked to the University of Moscow, a, the most prestigious university in the Soviet Union. He will be admitted at the age of 19 um, into law school there. And it's an odd choice because certainly 1950 Stalin is still um, in power and lawyers did not have particularly a lot of authority or even respect in the Stalin era of the Soviet Union. Nonetheless, he does, um, he is admitted to Moscow and for the first time in his life now, um, he travels to Moscow by train and uh, begins studying at the university. It's at Moscow University that young Gorbachev will meet his uh, wife, Larissa, who is also a fellow law student at that faculty. In the middle of Gorbachev's um, education as a lawyer, Stalin will die in 1953. And, and so Gorbachev graduates law school in 1955, along with his wife um, as Khrushchev, a progressive is uh, um, consolidating his power. And um, Gorbachev will become a creature essentially of the Khrushchev era and of um, Khrushchev progressive uh, policies. He will become this communist apparatchik, um, part of the apparatus, making his way up the ladder of um, the hierarchy and the nomenclatura. He is in, um, by the time Brezhnev takes power. He is, as I say, a product of uh, Khrushchev and uh, fits quite well into the stagnation of detente era Brezhnev policies. He is 
in um, a younger liberal faction of um, high-ranking members of the Communist Party. Um, when Brezhnev initiates the Brezhnev Doctrine with the invasion of Czechoslovakia, Gorbachev is not um, particularly enamored with that policy, um, although he doesn't openly criticize the invasion of Czechoslovakia, but among his close fellow friends inside the party, his comrades, um, there is kind of this liberal faction that Gorbachev belongs to, and privately they're very critical of the turn that Russian policy had suddenly taken in, in, in 68. It was a surprise, really, that at the moment that Russians had been negotiating with the United States, a um, kind of this, this detente that they would do what they did, uh, despite the fact that, again, the United States would not punish them in particular for this in 1968. Gorbachev will eventually um, be brought to um, Moscow after serving, after he graduated law school, he ended up serving in his home district as a uh, party manager. He will eventually be brought in to Moscow. Um, he will, in 1978, be appointed as secretary to the Central Committee and um, he will now rise up in the Central Committee of the Communist uh, Party. He becomes one of these kinds of, um, you know, middle-class progressive communist functionaries who um, are enamored with the promise of detente and uh, you know, live a relatively what we would describe an upper middle class life in stagnation era Soviet Union. So he is among the youngest members of the Central Committee upon the death of, um, you know, Cher Chernenko. And here you can see him. In fact, he's probably the only member of the Central Committee can, who can actually act as a pallbearer. Um, you know, he's, he's uh, young and uh, vigorous, and he becomes the next choice as Moscow's new boss, as uh, this Time magazine cover proclaims from March 25th, 1985. Younger, smoother, and probably formidable is the prediction uh, from Time magazine in um, the midst of Reagan's uh, presidency at this point. So Gorbachev comes to power in the middle of Star Wars and um, you know, you may remember again, uh, Reagan will characterize the Soviet Union as the evil empire, and um, Reagan will visit the Berlin Wall and, and call out, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, um, take down the wall. So Reagan, despite this kind of appearance of Gorbachev perhaps being as a new wind in the Soviet Union, Reagan at first is very skeptical of um, any leader in the Soviet Union at that point and presses on with his uh, rollback agenda. It's um, Gorbachev's first foray outside the Soviet Union that begins what we will characterize as the Gorbachev era. Um, Gorbachev, when he travels to London and meets with Margaret Thatcher, absolutely charms Thatcher, who, the Iron Lady, who herself is quite the new cold warrior um, and, and is certainly a close ally of Ronald Reagan. Um, 
Margaret Thatcher is impressed with Gorbachev's intelligence, his um, intent, his character, um, everything about Gorbachev leads Margaret Thatcher to conclude that this is a communist that we can actually deal with and uh, maybe live with now in, in the future. And so uh, Thatcher will essentially anoint Gorbachev as someone that NATO countries uh, can engage with in the restoration of a new relationship. Maybe not detente, um, maybe not even containment, but something new. And it will be Margaret Thatcher who will now go to Reagan and essentially sing her praises uh, of, of uh, Gorbachev. Gorbachev will implement a number of fundamental reforms in 1985 that will characterize his uh, six years in, in power. Um, firstly, he will introduce a policy known as perestroika. Um, perestroika literally translated uh, means reconstruction. It's an attempt to rebuild the Soviet economy as a mixed economy, something midway between the central planning command economy of the Soviet Union with free market mechanisms. And, and the first thing that Gorbachev will do is he will allow the formation of small, what the Russians call cooperatives. Um, you know, for all intents and purposes, cooperatives, we can say are um, kind of... Um, joint proprietorships, private proprietorships, not quite corporations, uh, but at least private proprietorships for small businesses, stores that Russians could now start up. Um, previously in the Soviet Union, um, running a any kind of business of your own, whether you're, you know, a locksmith or whether you have a small stand selling, um, you know, bottled water or ice cream and, and, and so forth. Um, to do that as your own proprietor was considered a crime, uh, a crime of economic speculation. And, and, and so Gorbachev begins introducing on a small level these kinds of private proprietorship with the intention that gradually these proprietorships will become bigger and have a greater scope while the Soviet government would still run the major kinds of activities like, you know, oil production or the railway system, the postal system and so forth, which actually is an aspect of capitalist economies often as well, apart from, you know, the oil uh, companies. So this, of course, mixed uh, free market economy with a small private economy is, is going to actually result, unfortunately, with um, you know, in chaos uh, over the period of the Gorbachev regime. Uh, the other uh, policy that he will introduce is glasnost, um, or again, literally translated as transparency. This um, called for greater openness in society and politics, in particularly around the question of the freedom of speech. And um, for the first time, it's under Gorbachev that we begin to hear about the past, about Stalinist crimes, um, about past and current errors taking place in the Soviet Union, criticism of Soviet communist functionaries by name, directly um, criticism of their policies and, and, and so forth. So there is a... a 
substantially greater freedom of speech and more importantly, freedom of press uh, in, in the Russian print media and on Soviet television as, as, as well through the second half of the 1980s. There is also what Gorbachev will introduce, a democratization of the Soviet state. Um, and for the first time since 1917, since um, the February Revolution, the kind of Republican Revolution that occurred when the Tsar and the monarchy was overthrown, Gorbachev will allow for free elections to take place in the Soviet Union in um, 1989. And um, the meetings of the Congress of People's Deputies that result from this um, democratic election will be televised. And um, I'm there at that point in time, watched breathlessly by everyone on uh, Russian television. But um, that's still a little bit um, ahead of us here. The other thing that Gorbachev will um, do is he will withdraw troops from Afghanistan. And he will officially now repudiate the Brezhnev doctrine. And unlike this slide, which claims that he encouraged reform in Eastern Europe um, uh, and that he you know, encouraged demands for autonomy by non-Russian minorities, uh, I, I think that's giving Gorbachev perhaps a little bit too much credit. I don't think he encouraged um, either reform in Eastern Europe nor encouraged um, demands for autonomy, but he certainly tolerated it and um, did not um, intervene in the kind of natural rise of these demands in non-Russian territories as well as in um, Eastern Europe in the Warsaw Pact countries. So at the very least, he stood aside. And so uh, very quickly, again, if we go by Time magazine, we see that um, what Gorbachev is doing is characterized as a revolution. And in many ways it is. Um, the questions we all have is, can he make it work? Um, is indeed the Cold War now fading? So all these questions we, we are indeed asking. I am, uh, by this time, in 1985, starting from 1985, I'm overseas working for CNN in um, the rapid deployment unit that was based in Rome, Italy, that um, gave us kind of an ability to, um, you know, being kind of in the central of Europe, in the center of Europe gave us an ability to deploy anywhere north and, and south, all the way to, in fact, um, South Africa. I covered stories from um, the release of Nelson Mandela from uh, prison to the emerging stories in, in the Soviet Union, as well as throughout um, Europe at that time. And um, also being a documentary filmmaker on my forays to the Soviet Union, I began to establish relationships with Soviet filmmakers and the filmmakers union. And there I witnessed probably the first sign we began to see of the extent and scope of Gorbachev's reforms. These occur very early, and they first occur in the Soviet Filmmakers Academy, uh, kind of like the American Academy of uh, Film Arts is the same thing in the Soviet Filmmakers Academy. Um, at that point, uh, the um, Filmmakers Academy and the film industry was dominated by 
um, Sergei Bondarchuk, who uh, starred as Pierre in that famous, you know, seven-hour epic production of War and Peace that you might have seen. I think it was released here in the West in the 1970s. Um, he not only uh, starred in it, but uh, Sergei Bondarchuk was also the director of this epic filming of War and Peace. Um, it was shown here, I know, in theaters um, in, in these three and a half hour episodes. Uh, there was a part one and, and, and part two. I remember going with my family to see it in the theater in Toronto. Um, it, uh, I think, was the first, among one of the first Soviet um, films to get significant recognition from um, uh, Hollywood at, 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 at that time as, as well, other than the smaller films, a few black and white films that were made in the early 60s. But um, Sergei Bondarchuk, of course, uh, essentially became this um, almost like a studio head dominating not only the creative um, aspects of filmmaking in, in Russia, but as well, the production aspects as well. What got made often was um, decided by Bondarchuk on the studio uh, level. So he had all this power, but in 1985, Sergei Bondarchuk is overthrown and um, Elem Klimov is elected. Um, as the new head of the Film Academy. And of course, Lem Klimov is the 1985 director of uh, Kamensi, E.G. Smutri. Um, Kamensi, uh, you'll find it often on the list of the 10 most shocking films um, ever made. Um, and it is indeed, it's a very disturbing uh, film if you had not seen it. Come and See, of course, is a reference to um, passages in um, the Bible, Revelation, uh, chapter 6, verse 7, 8, which goes uh, like this. Um, and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And indeed, come and see is a shocking treatment of um, Russian World War II um, war trauma um, and the death and hell that followed. It's um, Russia's apocalypse now of the Second World War. Um, it's a brutal, shocking film. Uh, Bondarchuk intended to suppress it. Um, however, um, firstly, the Moscow Film Festival awards it the grand uh, prize. Um, the film is released to shock, but critical acclaim. Um, and of course, its, it's director, L.M. Klimov, is now elected as, as well the head of the, the Russian or the Soviet Filmmakers Academy. Klimov himself had previously acted on behalf of another very controversial Russian film also dealing with World War II issues. Uh, Larisa Shepitkos' uh, 1976 The Ascent, Voskhoshjenia, um, this film also dealt with uh, the trauma of the Second World War, but in particular focused on 
the Nazi occupation of Belarusia, of uh, Belarus, and touched a nerve by its portrayal of um, collaboration by fellow Russians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, and so forth with the Nazis. It's almost a retelling with, of, of, of um, the crucifixion of uh, Christ, where again, you, 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 know, you have that scenario in um, the Bible of once again, kind of collaborators working with Rome in the execution of, of uh, Christ. And, and, and so there is this uh, kind of subtextual uh, spiritual awareness in the ascent that back in um, 1976 would have um, troubled Bondarchuk and Bondarchuk tried to suppress the film and Klimov at that point was um, a functionary in the film industry who managed to essentially bypass uh, Bondarchuk and the formal um, system and get the film released. Certainly the ascent is um, as disturbing as common sea is. And again, it, it just all that trauma of the Second World War that Russians carried is just torn out of their souls in both of these films. So this sudden um, change in the Filmmakers Academy signaled to other cultural institutions that suddenly there's a new openness in uh, Russian popular um, and classical culture. In particular, we began to see in theater uh, kind of self-critical plays that would not have been um, allowed in certainly in the Brezhnev era. Um, much of this was reminiscent of um, the, the Khrushchev thaw when work that would have been prohibited under Stalin suddenly became uh, produced and available to Russians under uh, Khrushchev. But remember very quickly, the Khrushchev thaw chilled and, and some of those writers like Solzhenitsyn, whose works were at first published under Khrushchev, then were banned again. And, and, and so there is this kind of um, suspicion, but nonetheless, the Russian creative community, artists, um, musicians, playwrights, authors, now will leap into this what appeared to be new progressive um, era with um, unique and, and um, unthinkable in the, you know, a couple of years earlier works of um, art, theater, and, and, and writing. Um, in particular, um, Russian rock. Uh, Russians, of course, have always been um, interested in jazz. Uh, um, jazz was for a while prohibited by Stalin as being an aspect of um, cosmopolitanism. But um, once, uh, once Stalin dies, of course, uh, jazz returns. And, and we know there is this kind of relationship between jazz and uh, the emergence of, of, of rock and roll. And, and, and so by the um, 19, mid 1980s, we begin to see kind of official Russian rock, where, um, as you might have seen if you've watched my film, Russian Rock Underground, you might have seen where uh, Communist Party officials would review the lyrics of um, any Russian rock band performing on um, in any venue prior to giving permission to play on a stage, they would need to get a permit that their lyrics have been approved 
um, in Moscow, there wasn't particularly a, a formal system, a rock laboratory uh, that encouraged um, a kind of, um, you know, non-offensive um, lyrics, non-confrontational lyrics. So these became official Russian rock musicians who worked with uh, that kind of permit system. But then you also had a whole school of unofficial Russian rock or underground Russian rock, which I was particularly interested in, that um, now began to perform in various private venues and eventually began to force themselves onto official stages at various cultural clubs, uh, communist party theaters, and, and, and so forth. So um, that, in fact, was one of the first documentaries I produced inside the Soviet Union. It eventually aired on much music and on, on channels in Italy and, 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 and so forth. Um, and it, it was an early a glimpse into what Gorbachev, Gorbachev's Russia was beginning to look like um, early, late 1987, early 1988, Russian Rock Underground. And I posted a link to the documentary uh, there. Um, sorry for the quality, the visual quality of it, the audio quality it um you know we're talking about old technology that's around 40 years now three quarter inch um, video that i used on which to shoot it and um the way i sh I, I shot this documentary i offered um myself and my camera crew to three russian uh underground rock musicians um to produce you know, um, a video of their dreams, essentially, um, you know, even underground bands here in North America really did not have access to the kind of technology and money to produce a video. And, and um, I was able to do that for um, these three bands, um, two of them. Uh, you can see uh, certainly Televisor and Aquarium. Uh, wrote these very elaborate um, videos that uh, I produced for them and incorporated into my documentary. And and then Peter Mamamov of Zvuki Mu, uh, who's quite a character and, and actually became a movie star in Russia afterwards, playing essentially the kind of role he, um, you can see him performing the video. Um, Peter Mamonov just uh, came in with, you know, a huge bottle of vodka and, and said to me, do whatever you want, uh, and performed his uh, song, uh, the, you, the Press Union song. Here he is, Peter Mamonov. He's doing this in quite a, as I say, drunken uh, state. I kind of often um, compared to him to, uh, you know, Devo or early um, Burn from the Talking Heads, this, this kind of twitchy performance that um, he did. What um, I began to see when I was um, in Russia in those early years was that we liked Gorbachev a lot more than the Russians did. Um, you know, there was this uh, kind of Gorby mania here in the West that a lot of Russians did not really share with us. Um, as enthusiastic as we Westerners were about Gorbachev, the Russians were actually quite sullen um, about Gorbachev and, and very cynical. And in, in, in fact, this painting by Eric Bulatov of that era perfectly captures the kind of cynicism that Russians felt, particularly as Eric Bolotov describes in my film, Mondo Moscow, 
a lot of Russians who had lived through the Khrushchev thaw and, and saw it cool. Um, there was suspicion and um, fear among Russians of these changes, in particular, the promise of these changes. Um, Russians were cynical about, uh, about it. And, and, and um, for a number of reasons, partly the past, um, and indeed, I think Gorbachev was much more popular in the West than he was inside his own uh, country. Under Gorbachev, these market reforms halfway between a capitalist and socialist system crippled the socialist sector on which the average Russian depended upon, um, on the socialist state payrolls, or people on fixed income, particularly pensioners who are going to be now devastated by this um, splitting in the market. What used to be state-supplied um, sources of uh, food for an average Russian began to run dry as food producers saw market opportunities to sell food um, at a much higher rate than in the subsidized Soviet state food system. It, this resulted by the 1990s um, food rationing in the Soviet Union. Um, shelves were sparse and um, sometimes completely empty while uh, private entrepreneurs began um, a very lucrative period of, um, you know, the private marketing of food, uh, pricing tomatoes, essentially at what a tomato would be priced in um, North America. But um, unfortunately, the ruble was not worth the same uh, currency amount that North American currency was worth. Officially, the Russians insisted that uh, one ruble was equivalent um, roughly to um, one dollar. Um, that resulted in kind of a double economy. Um, because Russians would sell rubles at, um, well, a bank would give you for $1, one ruble, Russians would sell you for $1, 200 rubles, and eventually 500 rubles, and eventually 1,000 rubles. And, and so you begin to see this kind of double economy where uh, food prices are fixed uh, at, at a kind of the Western exchange rate worth of the ruble at a thousand to one, as opposed to one to one. And, 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 and so for those that had either dollars or a, a realistic amount of rubles, they had um, access to all these private stores um, where food was abundant. And then, of course, on top of that, 1990, McDonald's opens its first store in the Soviet, first restaurant in the Soviet Union. Um, this is the largest McDonald's in the world. And, and what made it unique, of course, is it sold Big Macs um, at the official ruble price. And, and, and so people would line up at uh, by the thousand. I know this line uh, looks insane, um, but remarkably, it moved very fast. If you were at the end of this line, you would arrive at the counter in about 20 to 40 minutes tops. Um, if you wanted to come in, this is this. I don't know if it still is, but at that time, this was the largest McDonald's in in the world. And again, it, uh, when you go to Mondo Moscow, if you haven't, um, you can just see how massive it was um, when our camera crew shot in, in inside of there. 
Interestingly enough as well, this McDonald's was not set up by the American branch of McDonald's, but was set up by our own Canadian branch. Um, and, and, and so um, Cohen, I think, was the name of the CEO, Canadian CEO of McDonald's Canada. He had been um, pushing his way into the Soviet Union, I, I think, from the time that Pepsi got in there. And so one way for the Russians to sustain themselves was by um, gobbling down these Big Macs at a very reasonable price that an average Russian could afford. U.S.-Russian relations were now restored and, um, in fact, um, optimistically restored to even a better relationship than under the period of uh, detente. Uh, Reagan, after uh, Thatcher's endorsement of Gorbachev, indeed found Gorbachev as a pliable partner um, to work with in Europe. Um, as I say, the Brezhnev Doctrine was renounced. Um, a new um, treaty was signed, START, uh, and uh, democracy was uh, promised, and, and Russia began to loosen, essentially, its paranoid grip on the Eastern Warsaw Pact countries which um, Russia had depended upon to um, perform as a buffer between any kind of potential aggression from the West. And, and so um, going from evil empire to suddenly a um, perhaps partner in the new world structure, in, in, in fact, um, I think Reagan referred to it as the new order um, or the new world order, because that was Hitler's term, the new order. I think Reagan used the term the new world order. Indeed, suddenly um, Gorbachev and Reagan showed promise of um, working as partners in this new world order. In 1989, you have the first democratic elections in the history of Russia since 1917. Uh, elections for the Congress of People's Deputies. And for the first time, non-communist parties or independents could run in this um, election. Of course, uh, the Communist Party had a powerful grip on the, the population. Partly, um, you know, it's not just every member of the Communist Party, but then you have all the families of Communist Party members, um, the privilege in the nomenclatura that they all share. These are all aspects of communist power in the Soviet uh, Union. And, and, and so these um, elections in the winter of 19. Um, 89 are, as I say, the first democratic elections. Nonetheless, 87% um, of deputies elected to the Congress were from the Communist Party. Only 13% were independents. Um, and nonetheless, people uh, like, for example, the dissident Andrei Sakharov, the nuclear scientist, are elected to the office of deputies. And, it, it you know, uh, five years previously, it would have been unthinkable that even someone like um, Andrei Sakharov could even raise his head. Um, and yet he found himself sitting and speaking um, in televised broadcasts in the Congress of uh, Deputies. Um, Anatoly Sobchak, who is going to be critical to Putin's future, was also elected as um, independent. Um, one of the communist deputies elected to this new Congress of People's Deputies was Boris Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin 
is also of Gorbachev's generation. In fact, they're born in the same year, 1931. Um, he also comes from a peasant background. Um, he also lived on the collective farm. He also, like Gorbachev, was secretly baptized into the Christian faith. Um, he also had relatives who were arrested during collectivization and uh, during uh, the purges. Um, unlike um, Gorbachev, fortunately for Yeltsin, he did not endure the Nazi occupation. And so he was uh, coming from Sverdlov, uh, in, in, in the eastern part of Russia. Um, I'm not quite sure if it's actually in Siberia, but it's bordering on, um, it's certainly on Siberia. Um, he was schooled during the Second World War away from the German occupation. So he's fortunate in that. He would have attended high school, 1945 to 1949. Um, he didn't particularly like going to school. He, um, Yeltsin as a young man, was um, a little rough around uh, the edges. Um, you may uh, notice he's missing a thumb and a forefinger on his uh, left uh, hand. Uh, that comes from his playing with hand grenades when he was a, a teenager. So uh, that's, a, I, I think, an interesting, certainly, insight into Yeltsin's uh, psychopathology as a, as, uh, as a teenager. He'll graduate high school in 1949. Um, he'll um, again enter into an educational institute, the Ural Polytechnic Institute, um, when Stalin is in power, but he'll graduate once, um, you know, when Stalin is dead. So halfway through his education, Stalin will, will die on, on him. Um, at the Polytechnic Institute, he um, studies the building trades. He ends up um, working in uh, supervising construction, then um, as a textile factory manager. Um, he joins the Communist Party much later than Gorbachev did. He joins uh, the Communist Party in 1961 and will begin his rise in the Sver Sverdlov district party apparatus. Um, he, um, in 1981, will become a member of the Communist Party um, Central Committee. And, of course, we, um, as much as, Gorb you know, um, Yeltsin's reputation as, as a reformer, um, let's not forget, while Yeltsin was a boss during the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, Yeltsin um, oversaw the destruction of the villa in which uh, the Tsar and his family had been executed, um, which had become this kind of shrine for um, Russians. So Yeltsin put it to the bulldozer. So much for kind of the reformist reputation. Nonetheless, um, certainly Yeltsin is popular. He's a man of the people. He um, developed this reputation of intervening personally in, um, you know, mismanagement and um, Communist Party apparatus, uh, corruption. He would root it out, as I say, in person, responding uh, to people face on face. And so it made him a popular um, personality within the Communist Party. And in December of 1985, Yeltsin will be brought to Moscow by Gorbachev and appointed as the head of the Moscow Communist Party um, 
urban administration, the uh, Gorkom in Moscow, Gosudarstvenny Komitet or Government Committee. Once Yeltsin is elected to uh, the People's Congress, Yeltsin and Gorbachev begin butting heads. In, in fact, they already began prior to Yeltsin's election, and that's one of the reasons, in fact, um, Yeltsin ran. Um, Yeltsin thought that Gorbachev was too conservative and not radical enough in the 